Okay, well, in the sake of time, because uh, Jay, I know that's a concern for you, we will go ahead and kick it off. Uh, first, welcome to everyone in our viewing audience for joining our Industry Insider webinar series. Uh, we have three wonderful faculty today presenting on demystifying wellness trends. Uh, they are all part of the School of Health and Exercise Science. And uh, leading things off, we have Dr. G. Kang, who is uh, a professor who has taught applied physiology, nutrition and metabolism, and a research seminar all at TCNJ. He has uh, solo authored two books, as well as numerous amounts of uh, publications, articles, uh, all of which can be found on our website and uh, our, our faculty directory. Uh, joined, uh, joining him also is Dr. Laura Bruno, who has taught classes at the university level, including health education, health pedagogy, physical education, PE pedagogy, and wellness education. She has uh, also numerous publications in the field of health and wellness and has been part of the TCNJ team since 2015. And last but certainly not least, we have Joanne Smith Tavner, who teaches stress management at the school. She also shared with us earlier that she is a TCNJ graduate, uh, both undergrad and master's in 2003 and 2004, and has been a part of the team since then. So thank you uh, to the three of you for joining us. Uh, we have a very diverse panel that's gonna cover a lot of information. Uh, I do wanna add to our audience that if you have questions, please feel free to use the chat or question and answer feature. And I will facilitate those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, with the exception of any questions uh, for, for G's portion of the presentation, he does have to leave us early. Uh, as I mentioned, our panelists are all faculty members, so he has class uh, this afternoon, so he does have to leave early. So we'll kind of jump to his questions uh, before we move into the uh, next two presenters. So um, with that, I will kick it over to G to start. I believe you're gonna share your screen with us. Um, all of our presenters have some slides. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. All right, I'm going to share my screen. I hope that is. Um, let's see. I'm going to um, try to have a uh, the play mode. Um, Looks good to us. We can see the uh, see the slides here. Okay. All right. So great. So yeah, thanks, Pam. Uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. And I think this is going to be the good ones. <laughs> So I like to start with this alarming statistic about the about obesity. So uh, we know that we're at this moment. Uh, I mean, so only right now, 30% uh, of the U.S. adults are obese, meaning you know their body mass index is large, larger than 30. Now, what's even more alarming is that you know by 30, I mean by 2030, and the obesity rates is going to go up to you know uh, uh, report 50%. So. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the webinar of this kind is only a very important and a very timely as well. Now, moving on to the cause of obesity and, uh, you know, the, the diagrams showed a very obvious reason for why that happens, right? And we're obviously eating too much and we're obviously not moving much. So that positive energy balance is probably the most obvious reason for why, you know, we're gaining weight over time. Uh, now, um, in terms of how to solve the problems. So, I mean, from the scale, you already see that, okay, we're gonna have to talk about the diet, right? And then we also have to talk about other parts as well. Uh, and then, so, uh, you know, there's so much information out there. Now, how to filter these information. Right? So I, you know, I got those questions all the time in my class and, you know, the top 10 diets, okay, I'm gonna go for it. Now, uh, there are two different rankings and which one are gonna go for? You know what, my position is very clear and I'm gonna go with the, the less one, okay? The top 10 best diet overall. The overall versus the fast acting, fast weight loss diet because the overall is gonna give you long-term benefits. Now, let me explain more of the fast acting first and then we're gonna address the problem. Uh, the fast acting, okay? And the fast acting uh, does have some science behind that. I often is because, you know, a tremendous caloric restriction uh, that causes this fast weight loss. And then also the high protein, high fat diet will then causes increase the ketone and the ketone can suppress the eating, suppress the craving, right? And the high protein, high fats, high fibers, and those foods are, are going to be more slowly digested. So it's gonna, you know, they're gonna stay in the stomach longer and then so that would make you feel full longer. 
which would then translate into less eating. Okay, so then the question is, can you stick with it? All right, so the research has shown that, okay, for six months, it's okay. I mean, you see this good results and you're excited about it, but then how about at the year end, you know, give yourself another six months. And then we often see that, that the benefits got disappear. Okay, so then that is the things I worry about it. You know, if we're gonna do that thing, we're gonna have to think about long-term. And the long-term is, you know, it, it's not <clears throat> achieved through this low carbohydrate diet. So now the reason why, you know, there's such a frustration is to not, you know, uh, not being able to stick with it is because of the set point, right? The set point is the concept that relates to the biologic control system. Right, so every time you start to lose weight and then, then you have this set point or control system that turns on to try to work against you. Okay, so it's a quite complex system, but I can highlight the two hormones. All right, these two hormones will actually react to what you do. Okay, so then look at the leptin on the left and the ghrelin on the right. Right, so as you begin to you know, lose weight, begin to reduce your caloric intake, and you're gonna see that the ghrelin is gonna stay high. All right, it's gonna drive you to eat. And the leptin on the other hand, uh, the hormone that's supposed to help you to stop eating, but then it gets reduced, All right? So you have this kind of bad combination of the two, which will then always put you on the spot. Are you gonna stick with it or you're gonna lose the battle? Okay, so uh, I mean, we see <clears throat> so many people actually, you know, uh, unfortunately lose the battle of it. Now I got, two studies, and I always love to share with the students, all right? And we talk about eating breakfast. Eating breakfast, okay? Eating breakfast will actually reduce overall production of a ghrelin, okay? That's the hormone that's gonna drive you to eat. But then if we can then reproportion the calories, okay? The caloric intake, and we you know, make a 600 out of 1500 to be eaten in the morning. And then we can then expect much less ghrelin productions. So as you can see, the weight loss effort is going to continue, right? As shown in this open square line. And so that's one study that I always like to share with students. I know this is tough. You know, you may have to miss a breakfast sometimes, but always keep that in mind, eat, okay? Eat in the morning, <laughs> not eat throughout the day. Uh, now, the other thing is uh, sleep, okay? And so uh, that is another issue that bothers students all the time. I mean, by young professionals as well. And then, so if you give yourself enough of a sleep and then you should see your leptin level will then be elevated and your ghrelin level will then stay low. And, and so that is a good combination, but then has to do with how well you, you sleep. So that's another factor that often gets overlooked. Uh, so can we set, you know, can we reduce the set point? It's a biological control system. It's a part of who you are. And then sometimes, you know, people then say, well, I'm not sure if I can do it. A uh, study has shown that you can do it, but you have to do it slow. All right, you have slowly making progress. Okay, as you can see that you have to think about not only to restrict the curl intake, not dramatically, but do a small portion at a time, but then also focus on the exercise, less sitting, stress reduction, and proper sleep. So, now, how to do things in the right way? Well, uh, I will say, well, you wanna be a, a bit more quantitative, okay? Try to stay more quantitative. Now, how to do this? One is the caloric intake. You know, you wanna kind of figure out how much is what you need it in order to support your daily activities. And the other is the macronutrient proportions. So uh, I'm showing you the formula and that those formula can actually be get from, you know, you can get those online and, and um, you can calculate your basal metabolic rate based on your height and weight. And then, then you can figure out the minimal calories you need in order to sustain life, All right? And then you may want to add a few more calories on top of it because you know you have to move, right? And so you need a calories to support your activities as well. So, I mean, we're talking about 1400 to 1800 to be BMRs and maybe another 300 on top of it. And then you then go up to about 1700 to 2000. All right, so those are the calories you have to always keep in mind, no matter how often you're gonna eat, uh, how, how less you're gonna eat. The other thing is the percentage, All right? So those percentage, the fats, you know, you can push up to 35% and protein, you might push up to 35%. Uh, 
those fine, but then you look at you know those fast acting diets, right? Rapid weight loss diets, keto diets, and Atkins diets, and those diets are actually really push for you know for the extreme. For example, protein, you know, for the Atkins diet, and needs to go up to seventy percent. Uh, and then for the keto diet, the fat percentage needs to go 80%. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it because those diets don't stick long, right? And so, so once again, so those are the two key things that you want to know. Uh, and then, uh, then if for those who really want to know how to do it, and then I'm going to give you this uh, website. Uh, it's very easy to use and very easy to follow, okay? The recommendations made by all based on the nutritional theory. Okay, and good practice as well. I mean, you see all these six different food groups and they all got emphasized. Uh, if you follow that, uh, that right way, uh, the, choose myplate.gov. Okay, so that's the website you wanted to keep in mind. And then once you follow that, and then you know that you will get proper nutrition, um, you know, on top of it, you know, having a decent caloric control. Uh, now the other thing I like to add on to it, and that is the, you know, uh, the fact that that's actually emerging to become important factors. Before, you know, I would say 10 years ago, people normally don't pay much attention as to the timing of it. Uh, now we're going to talk about it because this whole theory goes along with the circadian rhythm. Right? And, and so based on the circadian rhythm, you know, your metabolism is supposed to be more active during the day, especially early part of the day. So if you can then place your eating mainly during that time, and that will be less likely to, to, to convert some of the food into fats, right? So, so we, we're talking about the photo on the left side, and then that is, you know, uh, uh, two or three meals a day, they eat breakfast once again, all right? And hopefully you can stop your last meal a little earlier, all right? We may not want to say, hey, four o'clock, that might be too early, but how about six o'clock, 6 p.m.? Okay, so they definitely want to avoid late night eating for sure. And now you want to give yourself fasting periods, you know, between meals, overnight, so that you can let that body to turn into a fat burning mode. All right, so you want to do those things often and you want to do this every day so that you can always be, you know, you'll always be able to switch between fat burning and fat store. And definitely the fat burning is the one that you're concerned the most, right? So we would like to do that. And so those are the things that, you know, you wanted to also focus on, you know, in addition to uh, the total caloric intake and it's also macronutrient proportion. Uh, okay, so then uh, I, I, I'd like to um, actually end my presentation by just, you know, um, just showing some of the statistics right here. And that, that's actually coming from, the results coming from study that, you know, they surveyed those who had a successful stories. All right, so maybe we can kind of learn things as to what they did. Perhaps we can use it towards, you know, uh, uh, what we want to do. So uh, once again, we're seeing those who have lost weight and uh, are able to keep it weight loss for five plus years. And then we're talking about, you know, 98% of them actually eat diet that's low in calories and fats. I, I guess in that case, and the keto diet, definitely not going to be the choice for that, right? Uh, and then 90% of them exercise. And so, uh, uh, so that's another finding. Uh, and then 78% of them eat breakfast, okay? And then 75% weigh them at least once a week. So that we know that they are uh, conscious about, you know, uh, their body mass. And then 62% of them watch less than 10 hours of physical, I mean, 10 hours of te uh, uh, TV. So, so once again, there are, you know, they're physically active and then they, they, uh, they eat breakfast and they also have this kind of overall healthy lifestyles. So once again, going back to my initial slide and we would like to rebalance the scale, the calories versus, you know, the caloric intake versus the caloric output. And we know that that has to be approached that needs to be holistic, comprehensive. And, and I guess, you know, we, you know, our next talk is going to be on physical activities. So I guess it's a perfect timing to end it right here. And I'd like to just take your questions. Thanks so much, Jay. Thank you very much. That. Uh, I did have, oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Let me.
pull up the chat here again. I had a question come into me uh, that says, I, I am not particularly a breakfast person, but can you suggest some a, a breakfast meal that would be uh, low carb or, or healthy as it's put here? Yes. Uh, if, you know, uh, I guess as a student, uh, all, you know, eating breakfast all the time is probably not realistic. And then you can, so you can delay. You can delay the time. There have been studies showing that if you at least keep an eating window to be less than eight hours, all right? So you can then say, well, I'm gonna start from eight, 10 o'clock in the morning and then I'm gonna stop eating at four. And, and then that will actually also work, all right? So, so we're talking about intermittent fasting almost, but then this is more of a mild version of it, uh, eight to 10 hours of eating. So then you can then have uh, 12 to 14 hours of, of fasting. So still, you know, the fasting period needs to be pushed a little bit, but uh, yes, you, yeah, you can do that and just delay your eating and start at 10 and then, but end the eating earlier. Uh, okay, the next question that came in and I, I, I don't think this is what you were suggesting, suggesting, but it says, is one meal a day realistic? Uh, that has been some study done and you might lose a few pounds over a three month period. I believe those studies actually use a three month as intervention period. Uh, uh, I do not suggest that. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't, um, it probably doesn't stick that long, okay? And, uh, you may be able to do it for, for, for eight weeks, uh, two months, three months, but then it's just not a good sign. And then also it might, jeopardize your nutrition intake as well. I mean, you want the nutrients coming from different sources. So you still need to give yourself a, a couple of times of eating throughout the day to get those things that you need. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, we have a question pertaining to sleep. Does sleep have to be continuous? I often wake up after four hours, then go back to sleep. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a sleep expert, but I, uh, the, still the proper amount, uh, you know, people do have those kind of fragmental sleeps and they, they, they wake up asleep and there's also deep and uh, sh shallow sleeps. But then uh, I would say still the numbers of uh, the study that I show you guys, and that was actually a, uh, uh, the continuous sleep. So seven to eight hours a night. Uh, then what if you wake up and then you go back to sleep again and you, 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 then you complete the next four hours of it? Uh, I, I don't have a concrete answer to that, but I would say that's good. Uh, it's, you know, ultimately, it will allow you to have this best combination of you know, leptin and ghrelin concentration. Great, thank you. And we have one more question. Uh, the government food period has been wrong so many times. Why is a .gov site recommended? Uh, you mean the food? Yeah, the, the food. Yeah. yeah, I would say, uh, you know, that, that still, uh, the methods are still good, okay? And then the, uh, the idea behind that is also good because it emphasizes uh, the fact that you want to be mindful of the quantity you consume and you want to be mindful of the variety that you are taking in. Uh, you want to be mi mindful of the physical activity that you need to build in to calculate uh, the, the total caloric intakes. So the general idea is fine. I'm okay with it. I like the idea. And, you know, the photo I show you guys, there was a guy exercising on that pyramid and then there's also six different colors. Uh, that's the varieties and you also see the triangle meaning that you can proportionate it based on how you know how many calories you burn so uh i would say still okay with the use the ideas but then in terms of fine you know i'm i'm not sure exactly what question it is but and overall i kind of still like the idea the, the principle behind that website perfect thank you You're welcome all right, G. Well, thank you again. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I know you have to head off to teach a class. So thank you for uh, accommodating this. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, accommodating Thanks, yeah. this, this webinar. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Pam. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for attendance. Okay, Laura, looks like you're all set. Thank you. And I will uh, turn it over to you.
Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Kang. That was wonderful. That's super helpful information for all of us to know. Um, Thank you, Laura. <laughs> so as Pam mentioned, I am faculty here at TCNJ with the Department of Health and Exercise Science. And I'm gonna sort of piggyback, continue to focus on the physical dimension of wellness, but my focus is gonna be more on uh, physical activity, that component. So to begin, I, ju I do just wanna kind of precursor this with the notion that um, since I know we have a lot of different people in the audience, it is important make sure before you start any type of exercise program that you consult with your doctor. Um, this is especially important if you are recovering from any kind of cardiac event or stroke. So everything that we'll talk about today is, is gonna be centered around the notion that you have the all clear um, and you're in a position where you're healthy and, and really ready to be active and, and um, engaging in regular exercise. Okay, <clears throat> so on that note, um, I'd like to open just by talking about these three terms. These are oftentimes used interchangeably, but I just wanna kind of point out some of the similarities and some of the differences with them. So you'll notice the first term physical activity. Um, you can see the definition, any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that increases energy expenditure. You can look at physical activity through a couple different lenses. Um, we can look at it through kind of the notion of we should be engaging in regular physical activity. Uh, you can look at it from an occupational lens. So in other words, it is possible that for instance, um, a mail carrier or a construction worker they're engaging in physical activity, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are physically fit. So the next term there, exercise, is defined as physical activity of a repetitive nature that is planned or structured with the overall goal to improve or maintain one of the health-related fitness components. So exercise is intentional physical activity where we are really looking to improve upon certain components of our fitness. And then lastly, physical fitness is sort of the ultimatum, right? So this is the optimum level. Um, we can obtain good physical fitness through regular physical activity and exercise. And so for my visual learners out there, this kind of provides you with sort of a visual, the spectrum of physical activity. Again, you'll see here are physically inactive. We can be physically active, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're physically fit. Um, a key way that we get physically fit is through exercise. All right, having said that, there are four types of exercise that we're gonna talk about today. Um, <clears throat> the very first one is endurance, and you can kind of see some examples here. There's also strength conditioning, there's balance, and there's flexibility. So ideally, when we're thinking about exercise, um, we wanna think robust. So an ideal scenario would include each one of these types of exercise. It doesn't mean we have to do each one every day, but truly, if we're looking for um, proficient and optimal, we want to think about variety. Okay, so I'm going to first kind of start by talking about this notion of strength. And um, <clears throat> so strength can actually be viewed through two different facets. There's muscular strength and there's muscular endurance. This is one of our health-related components of fitness. And ultimately, as we think through this idea, it really starts at whatever the participant's goal is. So I've worked before with students and with clients who have said, I don't wanna get bulky. I don't, I don't wanna do any kind of muscular you know, strength exercises. And I really have to kind of caution that because there is huge advantage to including strength training in your exercise regimen. So even if you're not looking to build, then your focus would be more on this muscular endurance. You'll see the key difference between the two is this the, the amount of force or the intensity. So muscular endurance is more a submaximal force over a period of time, whereas muscular strength is really a maximal amount of force one time through a full range of motion. Um, so what I would say to my, my clients or my students is, depending on what your goal is, you're going to then determine what type of exercise you would be doing. So when we look at muscular strength, we're looking at high weight, low reps. When we're looking at muscular endurance, we're looking at low weight or lesser weight, but higher amount of reps. So generally endurance is roughly 10 to 12 repetitions, whereas muscular strength roughly is about four to six reps. So both of these are really important as far as helping you become healthy and, and kind of get to that optimal level of physical fitness. It's more about the means and your goal, which will determine which area that you want to focus on. 
Okay. Um, the next component here, the next um, type that I'm going to discuss is this idea of balance. Balance is not a health related component of fitness, but it is a skill related component. And this becomes increasingly important as we age. <clears throat> the reason being that our sense of balance will actually deteriorate as we go through the aging process. Inside your ear is your vestibular system, and that is essentially how we perceive balance. When we age, these cells actually die off, and that can affect our ability to correct or recorrect our position. So in addition to the vestibular cells dying off, as we age, we're also um, typically decreasing our, our muscular strength, as well as um, experiencing decreases in our bone density. So those three things coupled together often can result in poor balance, which will then result in fall or injury. So it's important that as we're thinking about our overall sense of health and well-being now, we want to be doing some activities and some exercises that are going to allow us to maintain a certain level of balance, since we know that that's important as we continue to age. Um, one thing that is important to note is this does not have to be something that we, we focus on specifically. So in other words, we can take our, our activities that we're already doing and we can add, as I would call, a little bit of flair to them. And what that will do is it will allow us to focus on balancing without it necessarily just being a balance related exercise. So I'll give you an example. And what I will invite you to do, since you've all been sitting for about 30 minutes, I'll invite you to stand up so that you can kind of have a little bit of a brain break and pre prevent that Zoom fatigue. Um, the picture that I have for you here is I would just say, you know, kind of where you are, make sure you have enough space around you, but go ahead and plant your dominant foot. <clears throat> make sure your weight is in your heel, kind of lift your toes up so that they're loose, not on the ground. And then with your non-dominant foot, just go ahead and lunge backwards, making sure that the knee of your dominant leg does not go past the toe line of your dominant foot, right? So if you lunge down and come back up, one easy thing that you can do for something like a strength training exercise is you can add an element of balance. So now try that note, that motion again, but this time kick forward with that non-dominant leg. So right there, you're taking an exercise that possibly is gonna be working on building your lower body strength and you're adding an element of balance to it. So as you think about the types of activities that you engage in, as you think about the exercise that maybe you are participating in, see if there aren't ways that you can actually in include these elements to them. Okay. All right. Um, the next type of exercise is flexibility. Flexibility, when we look at all of the health-related components of fitness, um, flexibility is, is typically the, oftentimes the most overlooked. Um, and I think that speaks to, as kids, we tend to be more pliable, we're, we're naturally more flexible. So as kids, we don't necessarily see value to being flexible and having a good range of motion. Um, I will give the example, I just went sledding with my, with my kiddos the other day, taking advantage of this nice winter snow. And I noticed, you know, for some of the kids, they fly off the sled or they hit a bump, it's no big deal. And I kept thinking, Oof, where's that bump? I don't wanna hit it. Because I know that as an adult, to, to put my body through that, I'm gonna be feeling that for days, if not weeks. Um, and so flexibility is another thing that as we age, we start to find decreases in. So we wanna be proactive. We wanna try to incorporate and focus on these elements so that we continue to, um, you know, ultimately be more fit and have higher levels as we, as we kind of get older here. Um, again, we can look at two different types of flexibility. We have static and we have dynamic. Static is going to be your slow, sustained stretch. Um, generally speaking, this is what we want to utilize for our cool down. The flip side of that is dynamic, and dynamic is through movement. It's through motion. Um, Generally, when we're starting to exercise, especially if we're going to be working at a moderate to vigorous level, we want to be thinking through range of motion. So what types of movements can I do to actually warm my body up? You can almost think of your muscles like rubber bands. If you take a rubber band when it's cold and you stretch it, that rubber band is going to end up resulting in it's going to snap. 
Whereas if I warm it up first and then I take it outside, it's less likely to stretch and, and, and end up injured. So the same thing can be thought of with our muscles. And we just wanna make sure that we're keeping sort of those principles in mind as we exercise. Um, many of you will probably log on and watch the Super Bowl this week. And so if you click on before the game actually starts, you'll see those players out there moving through full range of motion. They'll be doing karaoke and lunges. They'll be warming up their arm muscles. That's because they're trying to prevent injury. And the way you do that is through active warm up. Cool down would be appropriate. You hold that stretch for roughly 20 to 30 seconds. And that will over time improve that range of motion and your flexibility. So there's an appropriate place for both of these. Um, and you just wanna make sure that you're keeping in mind, they've actually done studies to find that static stretching before you engage in exercise could actually decrease your power and strength and result in injury, which is totally different from what I grew up with in youth sports where it was take a lap and then circle and hold the stretch while we all count as a team. So a lot of research has come to the forefront and we start to see sort of where the value is in this capacity. Again, just to kind of put out there, um, something like yoga is going to check multiple boxes. So that'll include increased flexibility, that will increase in, improve balance, um, and then that can also help with muscular strength. So think about different activities that you can that you can participate in um, that will not you know not necessarily just focus on one component, but allow you to kind of hit multiple boxes with one stone, so to speak. And then I just put this picture here because something very simple, like bending down and tying your shoe, if you don't have good flexibility, that is something over time that will become more challenging for you. Okay, the final type of exercise is our endurance. Again, this is one of our health related components. You can see there, this is the ability to perform large muscle movements or whole body exercises at a moderate to high intensity for extended periods of time. Um, again, two different facets with this, aerobic on one side and some examples listed, and then anaerobic with some examples listed. Um, key things to touch on in regards to endurance is essentially um, the difference between aerobic and anaerobic is oxygen. Okay, so um, basically <clears throat> aerobic is going to be um, longer duration, so you can do this for an extended period of time, where anaerobic is going to be more short bursts. A aerobic with oxygen, you have enough oxygen to produce the energy that's needed to perform. With anaerobic or without oxygen, the demand is greater and you can't keep that energy level up. It's taxing, it's demanding. One rule of thumb that you could use to determine how hard you're working and what threshold you could possibly be in is what we term the talk test. And basically that allows you, if you can have a conversation, then you're likely using more of aerobic activities, okay? Um, you're probably in the light to moderate as far as where we fall in that spectrum. If you're having difficulty maintaining a conversation <laughs> like that, you're, you know, you're huffing and puffing, then you're probably more in that moderate to vigorous. And depending on the exercise, that could fall more in that anaerobic type of a category. Um, which one is better for fat, for fat loss? I'm so glad that you asked. They've actually indicated that if you're looking to burn more fat, right, or lose weight in regards to your fat, anaerobic is actually what's recommended. And the reason being is, A, it can burn more calories. It increases your metabolism. You'll experience something what is, what is better known as the afterburn effect, which essentially is once you're done with your exercise, your metabolism will be higher. So you'll continue to burn calories even after that fact. And finally, another key thing is it saves time. The number one reason that people cite for not exercising is lack of time. I think that the statistic was 42% say that that's the reason they don't exercise. Um, you know, I think that we're all very busy. We lead very busy lives. And so the thought of having to go to the gym for two hours is just not realistic. Something like a HIIT workout, which is your high intensity interval training, you could work for 30 minutes. They're periods of, of short bursts of activity followed by a period of rest, short bursts of activity, period of rest. And that's something that a 30 minute workout will meet those requirements. It'll hit all those elements as far as burning calories, afterburn effect, 
and increasing your metabolism. And you, re you really only need about 30 minutes to participate in that. So we're seeing a, a, that's actually one of the most common or one of the top trends for 2021. Um, and so I just wanted to share, I'll kind of close with this. These are some of those trends. Um, very quickly, uh, as far as differences, you'll notice that HIT is there on the list. And this list looks quite different than it did from 2020, probably more so than any other comparison of years. And that, a big part of that is the current pandemic. But number one on the list is online training. So that would be things maybe like a Peloton bike, um, you know, if you're logging in through your cable company, looking at HIIT workouts, beach body, different things like that would hit that online training, generally pre-recorded. Wearable technology would be something like our watches. It can actually keep track of how many steps. It can track our heart rate, sleep patterns. So there's lots of opportunities for us to improve our overall health through wearable technology. We also saw, um, I think it was on the list, I'm trying to remember exactly, but the one of the biggest searches when the pandemic actually shut down was um, fitness equipment. So a lot of people kind of look to maybe bring some weights in, some resistance bands. How can they improve their physical fitness levels during this current pandemic? Outdoor activities were also on the rise, things like taking hikes, um, playing outdoor sports, pickleball, tennis, things like that. We saw big increases in high intensity interval training, which I discussed. Virtual training is quite similar to online, except it's generally live. So in other words, if I'm a trainer, I might zoom in with my client and provide instruction in that capacity. Exercise as medicine is a holistic approach. Um, the idea is how can we help our, our practitioners to include the idea of, of prescribing them exercise and physical fitness, um, or excuse me, physical activity as part of a healthy uh, program to, to improve their overall health. And then strength training with free weights. So in closing, these are some of the benefits of physical activity. And I will leave you with a quote before I turn it over to Professor Smith Tavner. Um, and this was actually from the 14th Dalai Lama. And he was once asked, what thing about humanity surprises you the most? He responded, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money, then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. And then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he's never going to die and then dies having never really lived. So I think this is just a nice spot to kind of transition to talking about holistic health and finding balance. Our diet is part of that. Our physical activity trends, um, our commitment levels are part of that. Um, but it's not the full picture. And I think this is a nice segue into what Professor uh, Smith Tavner is going to talk about. I agree. Thank you, Dr. Bruno. That was excellent. And I was taking notes as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I agree, this is a great segue into uh, mental health. So uh, Joanne, please take it away. I think you're going to share your screen as well. Perfect. Uh, yeah, well, actually, I'm going to allow Laura to, to continue to share it because um, for time's sake anyway. Even better. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Bruno. Excellent job with covering all of the advantages of you know, exercise and physical fitness, aerobic, anaerobic. And uh, I'm a big fan. And, and it's always nice to hear someone else speak about health and exercise because you always learn something else or just it's just presented in a different way. Um, but that was just fantastic. Wonderful job, Dr. Bruno. And also I'd like to thank Dr. Kang and thank you, Pam, for allowing us to be here. So I get to talk about how we manage our stress and, and stress always gets that negative connotation. But before I can even talk about stress itself, because this talk is about wellness, I really wanted to cover or, or actually discuss what is wellness. Um, again, both my colleagues is, did a fantastic job with going over the physical aspect of wellness, with the physical aspect of you know eating properly with proper nutrition. Um, and Dr. Bruno just went over the physical aspect, how important it is to take care of our bodies physically. And um, Dr. Kang even talked about the importance of sleep. And all of those are so important, but please realize when we're looking at the wellness wheel, that is just one cog of 
our overall wellness. And I thought that because the idea of this was, you know, based on, you know, demystifying our wellness, that we should look at everything, the whole aspect of what makes up the individual. So this is just one example of a wellness wheel. Some other wellness wheels will include financial or and or environmental. Um, but I, I chose this one because this is the one that I use when I discuss with my students um, in stress management. So if I'm gonna move on from the physical aspect, no, I'm gonna go back, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to the wellness wheel. Um, and if I'm looking at my wellness wheel and I'm looking at the social aspect of it, and you know, today with the pandemic, everyone's you know trying to you know discuss what we're doing, social distancing. And I really never liked the idea of using the word social distance because it's so cut off. We were physically distancing ourselves from people, but we want to make sure we maintain those physical and, and those social interactions. And I know when the pandemic hit, it was so difficult because we weren't able to see loved ones and, and we still are not, you know, with the rise. So how, how can we maintain that social connection? Because we know socially, we are social animals and we need to socially interact with other people. And the way we best do that is um, right now what we're doing in our presentation, we're Zoom talking. So we, we still have that social connection and we can share ideas. So using things like your FaceTime on your phone, Skype, um, any type of technology that will still keep us connected. So that's part of our social wellness. And then looking into our intellectual wellness. And uh, I know because we are stuck in our homes, we've been stuck watching television which is mind blowing. And uh, you're listening to the news and you're hearing someone else telling us how we should think. And that's never a good idea either. We need to develop an, and expand our minds and think for ourselves and make our own informed decisions, not allow some newscaster or whatever it is. So turn that television off and stop listening to all the, 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 the garble and, and people, you know, talking in your ear and this is what you should think and this is what you should feel and, and you know, make our own decisions, perhaps pick up a book or, or something that's going to expand our intellectual wellness um, or listen to a webinar on, on how we can improve our wellness. Um, and then move into spirituality. And as far as the spirituality aspect of wellness goes, uh, a lot of people assume like spirituality and religion are the same thing and they are not. Uh, religion is exclusive, where spirituality is inclusive. How can we expand upon our spirituality? Um, something simple and going back to the physical activity aspect of what Dr. Bruno talked about, you know, going for a walk, uh, just being able to be outside and looking what is around us, knowing that we are part of, of something much larger than ourselves, you know, looking outside, taking a look up into the sky and realizing like this is mother earth it's beautiful and this is for us and, and we're only here for a short time so let's enjoy that in our spiritual connections with others and um you know i, I sometimes think we get lost with that um emotional and i i can't stress how important that is um and our emotions have been you know torn into to pieces with fear and anger and and feeling these isolations and uh, of course that leads to stress and how do, how do we work with, with, with our emotions? Well, maybe take some time out, whether it is a Zoom or a Skype call or, or watching something on television that is like humoristic and, and can help us kind of forget what's, what's going on with, um, you know, all of the negative um, talk that we hear outside. So connecting emotionally and thinking about the negative uh, feelings of, you know, anger and fear and looking to those positive ones, joy and happiness, which is the antithesis of anger and fear. So that's important too, not to get caught up in our emotions and um, look at balancing our emotions with, with happier emotions if we can. And finally, the other um, aspect of the wellness wheel is occupationally. Um, there's a saying that says, love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I, I totally believe and ascribe to that. Um, you have to have a passion for what you do. You can't fake passion. And if you love what you do, you don't feel like you're working. Uh, some people are stuck in jobs that they actually hate. And that could affect 
every aspect of the wellness wheel. I mean, if, if you just spies your job and that's going to affect your physical, you're not going to want to work out. You're not going to want to be social, hanging out with your friends, or you're going to talk about the same thing, how much you dislike your job. And intellectually, you're not going to open up or expand your, your, your thought process because you're stuck thinking about how much you dislike your job and spirituality. Well, you may not feel that connection. And of course, emotionally, the emotions are running wild. So let's go to our next slide and discuss what is stress and is all stress bad? Well, first of all, stress is, is, is something that's hardwired in our DNA, right? We are, we are born with this, this survival technique called the fight or flight system. And it's meant to protect us. You know, the caveman didn't have too many opportunities when he saw the saber-toothed tiger. What do you do? You either fight or you flee. Of course, you have a third option, you freeze. So either way, you're going to get eaten, right? So, um, you know, the idea behind the fight or flight response is for our own survival. And animals have a way of turning off their stress. You know, if, if a, a tiger is, is chasing after the zebra and the zebra finally escapes, well, then that stress is gone. But with us as humans, we, we kind of allow that stress or that chronic stress to kind of fester in our bodies. And that can wreak havoc on our immune system and, and our overall physical bodies. So is all stress bad? And no. And what stress is, is a perception because what may stress me out may not stress you out. Um, I often have my students watch a video um, of you know, Dr. Alice Dormer and describe what is stress. And you know, we, we get stressed when our technology, our phones aren't working or our computers don't work. And oh gosh, that's the most horrible thing that could ever happen. But what about the child or children who are wondering where their next meal is gonna come from? You know, am I gonna eat today? Um, so we do have different types of stress. And the stress I like to talk about is, um, you know, you stress is the positive stress. There's probably many students out there who are seniors and they're getting excited because they know, oh, wow, I'm going to graduate from college and that's exciting, but it's also a stress, but it's a positive one. It's one that's going to um, encourage you. And, and maybe it's also that sporting event that you're getting ready for. And um, it's that energy you're feeding off of. So it's a good type of, of stress, you stress. And that distress is that wear and tear. Uh, it, it's just like, you know, again, we can't shut it off and it degrades our immune system because it's kind of like in the analogy I like to use. It's like when you go to the grocery store or wherever you go and they scan the item and when your immune system is working optimally, you know, let's say it's a cancer cell and boop, it won't go through because your immune system will engulf that cancer cell and just destroy it. Right. So that's when our immune system is working properly. But when we degrade it by this constant chronic worrying, what about this? What about that? What about things we can't control? And um, when we go through that type of stress, um, you know, that cancer cell can easily kind of go right through the system. So that is the difference. And also cortisol is that stress hormone. And what happens is that cortisol can actually damage part of our brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is that short-term memory or like what I use, I like to call your GPS. It's kind of like when you go outside and you go, where's my car? You know, and it's going to destroy that. That type of stress is going to be constantly wear and tear on our bodies. So we need to manage it. And how are we going to manage it? Well, we have to look at our, at our next slide where we talk about our circle of control. And this is an exercise I, I have my students do when, when I talk live in class. Um, but this is something I also kind of discuss on our discussion board posts. We, we create a circle and on that outside circle, we list all the things that we cannot control, okay? And it's other people's reactions, obviously, uh, two things we can't control completely is what death and taxes, right? Um, and then we draw inner circle. And then in that inner circle, we look at what we can control and what actually we can control and what's our responsibility or is our reactions and our responses to the things that are surrounding us. Are we going to get aggravated because that person cut us off? Are we going to, you know, allow that, you know, stress to, to manifest itself into our bodies and harm our own bodies? Are we just going to say, well, that person was really in a hurry and just let it go? Um, and that's something we really need to look at is the big 
the big picture. You have control of your emotions. And that's something that this whole exercise teaches us. Okay, so let's look onto our next slide where we're gonna talk about, oh, I'm sorry, well, I talked about the stresses and um, we're gonna manage the, our stresses, our bad stresses by learning how to breathe properly. But before I teach you how to breathe properly, I want to go through on our next slide, because it discussed the distress and eustress, how we can assist with our mental health. Um, number one, and I think women mostly have a difficult problem with saying no, right? Hey, what are you doing this weekend? Um, nah, nothing. Hey, you want to help me move? <laughs> you know, um, saying no can be quite empowering. And people say, oh, that, that's just horrible. If there's something you just don't want to do or something that's going to take up your time and you feel as if it's not going to be beneficial to you, it's only going to create more stress, say no. You don't have to provide an explanation. You just, hey, would you like to? No. And just let it go. But as women, we have a tendency to like to explain, well, this is why, this is why. So I, again, just saying, saying no to stressors. Say no to the phone, turn the phone off because it, you know when you're looking at all the social media, it can become overwhelming. And I know women have a tendency to constantly compare themselves to what they see on Instagram or whatever it may be. Turn it off, say no. Uh, another important way to where we can help our mental health with our stress is through cognitive restructuring. What cognitive restructuring is, it takes something that is negative and turns it into something neutral or positive. Um, and this could be anything. Uh, people, you know, I'm, I personally am a breast cancer survivor. And I remember, you know, when I was diagnosed, it was like, oh gosh, why me? Why me? And I didn't want to get stuck with the identity of being a cancer survivor. I wanted to say, okay, well, this stinks. And what am I going to do to change the situation? Well, I can't physically change the diagnosis, but I can change my perception and how I look at things differently. Maybe I can appreciate life more. Life gave me lemons, I'll make lemonade out of it. That's what cognitive restructuring does. Exercise. Dr. Bruno went into this. I, even if it's not, you know, something aerobic, something like planned, at least go for a walk. And it, at this stage, if you're going for a walk, at least you're kind of tuning into your spirituality. But physical exercise. Uh, I believe the, the standard from the American College of Sports Medicine is 150 minutes a week. That's 30 minutes a day, 24 hours in a day. I think we can find 30 minutes, even if we have to break up that 30 minutes, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, and 10 minutes perhaps in the evening. It's something. Um, the, the other thing I have to talk about is connecting with nature. We're stuck inside. We're looking at our computers. Go outside. Appreciate what we have around us. Smelling the smells, um, looking at the snow, looking at the water, looking at the sky, looking at the trees. Connecting with nature is so important. We call that echotherapy. And um, it can really kind of calm ourselves down and kind of bring back, you know, uh, a sense of what we call homeostasis in the health and exercise science field. You know, it kind of brings us back to that calm. Um, manage your time. Many people like to procrastinate. And we know that procrastination, you know, often leads to stress, which also leads to distress and mental anxiety. Um, take big tasks and you know, kind of divide them into smaller ones so that things become more manageable. So if you have that huge paper that is due and you know when it's going to be due, start working on it. Do an outline today. Start doing some of your research. Start preparing. So manage your time can help you alleviate a lot of unnecessary and unwanted stress. Connect with friends. When I say connect with friends, you know, talk with them, make sure you spend time, call your mom, call your dad, call your, you know, your brothers and your sisters. It's so important to establish those connections, especially now when we feel so disconnected um, due to the virus and, and our isolation required um, to, you know, stop the spread, if you will. Laughter. Now, um, there, there's a lot to be said about a good old belly laugh. And comic relief is, is important to our overall health and well-being. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Norman Cousins. And Norman Cousins was diagnosed with a very debilitating disease. 
And doctor says that his, this disease was probably going to kill him. He was in the hospital and, and they gave him some strong morphine drugs to kind of manage his pain. And it really wasn't working. So what he did was he checked himself out of the hospital and he decided he was going to get all these like videos and watch like Laurel and Hardy and all these like comic reliefs. And he found that just by watching these videos, it provided hours of relief, more so than even the morphine did. And by the way, Norman Cousins did not die from that disease. He lived many, many years later and he died of something unrelated to that. So never underestimate, you know, uh, again, that the feeling of or, or the medicine provided by a good old belly laugh. Um, the next uh, part that I could talk about as far as you know, helping your mental health is pet an animal. I know at the college, or at least maybe maybe a few semesters ago, they would bring in pet therapy and allow students to kind of decompress, especially during, you know, um, during exam times. You know, petting an animal can actually reduce our cortisol levels. Now, cortisol is that stress hormone. And um, cortisol is what is responsible for that belly fat. And cortisol is something we use during exercise. So, because exercise in itself is a stressor, but it's a good stressor and it prepares us and it helps us manage our stress um, when we are faced with, you know, life choices, if you will. So petting an animal, it's kind of hard to be angry when you're petting an animal with that is giving you unconditional love. Um, so I, I highly recommend if you have a cat or have a dog or whatever that pet is, you know, spend some time petting that animal. Um, that can go a long way. Journaling. Now, journaling is a, a great way that can be very, very cathartic. There she goes. She's been kind of, okay. um, I like to journal, not just, you know, people think, oh, you got to write everything down. No, um, there's an exercise that I have my students do. I have them write down 100 things that went right today. And they go, 100 things? That's a lot of things. I go, no. Number one, you woke up in the morning. Number two, you had hot water to take a shower. Uh, number three, just list all the things that you're grateful for because gratitude you know, can go a long way in helping us to establish, wow, my life is pretty good, isn't it? Um, so instead of looking at the negative, look at the positive. Uh, that goes a long way. Uh, Dr. Kang talked about sleep and circadian rhythms and how important it is to get that, that normal REM sleep. And I know myself, sometimes I've had difficulty going to sleep and what do I do? You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna breathe and I'm gonna teach you how to breathe. But sleep is so, so important um, because we, we know that our body needs that time to prepare. So how can we, you know, how we sleep and if something's bothering you, what I recommend is I say, keep a worry book or just basically keep a pad next to your bed and write down those things that are bothering you, those things you in your head that you have to keep repeating because you feel like, oh, if I don't repeat it, I won't remember it. Sure you will. Write it down and then let it go. That's the biggest thing, letting it go. It's there. You're not going to forget it. So let it go. Um, you can also get a little diffuser in your bedroom and you can put some essential oils in that diffuser. Um, things like lavender are very, very calming and uh, chamomile can very calm down the body and help you to, re, um, to reduce your stress and help you to get into that nice REM sleep. And then finally, how do we help with our mental health? Breathing. Breathing can be and is the most easiest thing that we can do to manage our stress. When we're stressed out, what's the first thing that we do? We start to hyperventilate. We start, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And what do people tell you when you're stressed out? Just breathe. Um, by and large, in our society, we are all thoracic breathers. We breathe from up here. And what I wanna teach you to do is to, to breathe diaphragmatically. At the top of the screen is a picture of how to breathe properly using diaphragmatic breathing. Now I'm gonna demonstrate diaphragmatic breathing. What you're supposed to do is number one, if, if you're sitting, sit up nice and tall because you can't get all that air in if you're slumped over and you slouched at your computer. You could do this standing, you could do it seated or you could do it lying down. I want you to place your dominant hand, your right hand on your chest and your left hand on your abdomen. Now with diaphragmatic breathing, you wanna breathe in through the nose. And when you're breathing in through the nose, your belly expands, okay? and the chest stays quiet. 
So you breathe in deep through the nose, belly expands, you hold, there's a pause, and then you exhale through pursed lips. The idea is to breathe deep. Then I always have my students close their eyes and do it. And I say, and then create some type of imagery. Think of when you're breathing in, you're breathing in pure, unfiltered, you know, or filtered oxygen. And then, and when you blow out, you're blowing out all those toxins. So let's try this. So breathe in through the nose, pure air, hold it, and blow out all those toxins in your body. So that's what we call diaphragmatic or belly breathing. Okay, we also use this square, which I'm, I have like a quick little like demo that I could show you called square breathing, where you breathe in, inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, and then breathe again. Um, so the important thing is first teach in diaphragmatic breathing before you get into learning various breathing techniques, various breath breathing techniques such as box breathing, the four, seven, eight, Four, seven, eight uh, type of breathing is where you breathe in for four, you hold for seven, and then you exhale for eight. Now, some people say counting makes me stress. Well, then, um, you know, then I'm going to show you on the next slide what to do. Okay. And on the next slide, um, some people the, like the visualization. So if you went to this website, this little YouTube, it basically, this whole shape expands. So you breathe with the shape. And then you exhale when the shape basically, you know, kind of comes back to, to flatness. Now realize that, you know, some people say, well, I, I breathe better when I'm watching something or I'm not watching something, but the more of your senses that you can incorporate, the better you can help manage your stress. Okay. So those are some key areas where I would highly recommend that that you kind of incorporate, being mindful and being present with, with what's going on. Um, and, and Laura gave a great quote, quote, and one of my greatest quotes is from Mark Twain. Um, Mark Twain said that I'm an old man now and I've known many troubles in my life, most of which have never happened. Meaning that we incessantly worry about things we have no control over. So we need to let them go. And um, with that, I'm, I'm going to kind of move right into the Q&A if we have time. Um, I, there are some apps, if you are interested, I have it in the slides available, Calm, um, you know, Headspace, and I'm sure many of you have them. You could take five minutes a day, to just kind of help yourself calm down. Um, you know, if you have any questions on those, I'd be more than happy to send them to you. But Q&A and Pam. Thank you so much, Joanne. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. I think this was such a, a well-rounded uh, webinar on wellness. So thank you to all of our presenters. Um, in the uh, interest of time, I'll jump right into the uh, the questions, Joanne. One of the questions was about um, apps. So you did mention uh, a couple of them. Do you mind repeating? I think you said Calm is, is a good app. Uh, Calm is a free app. Headspace is another great free app. Um, I had them on that last slide. So there's, there's many of them out there that are free. Um, and of course, there are some that you can pay for. Some of them will help you like breathe. Some of them will give you visualizations such as the YouTube video that I have up there. And um, they're very, very beneficial. And, you know, with, with um, managing stress in some of these apps, meditation does not have to be something you have to dedicate 20 minutes. It could be something that takes five minutes. Meditation could be just sitting quiet and doing nothing and just letting things go. Excellent, thank you. Um, Laura, I think this one is for you. Uh, can you suggest the best flexibility exercises specifically for tennis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Sandra, it looks like, you know, when you're thinking about tennis, you want to think about cutting, right? So we want to be mindful as far as knee injuries. So definitely start with some type of a dynamic warm up. I would start even if you're just doing something on the court, um, hip openers, lunging, think of movements that you would incorporate during your gameplay in tennis. Um, another thing I always like to open up my shoulders. And so one quick trick for that is if you take your index finger and just kind of lean towards the ground, almost as if you were writing in the sand, like if you were at the beach, 
Um, and just make a circle with your show, like allowing your finger to almost touch the ground, make a circle, start small, make it larger. And that just kind of opens and loosens up your shoulder, which is going to be really important. We want to protect that rotator cuff and be mindful of that. So I would do that both with my dominant and my non-dominant just to get the shoulders kind of in motion and moving. Um, and then I would say too, especially when you're, when you're done with tennis, incorporate some kind of that pose. So we talked about that static flexibility, um, incorporate some stretches where you're going to improve that range of motion, especially hip openers as a female in particular, we're more prone to knee injuries. So being mindful of, um, our hips and trying to kind of keep flexibility in that capacity. I particularly love where I will kind of bend my leg and then come over it. Make sure you flex your back toe if you do that. It, I, I can't demonstrate it here, but um, it's, it's pigeon pose essentially in yoga, but that just allows you to kind of increase that range of motion and, and prevent your hips from tightening up on you. I don't know if that helps any. So definitely dynamic warm up because you will be moving, you'll be cutting, and then it's always a good idea to end with some type of a static stretch for that. Thank you, okay. Uh, and uh, another question uh, I saw come in, can you uh, make a suggestion for an anaerobic uh, workout that is low impact? Absolutely, so HIT can still be low impact. I love HIT, and I think uh, I tried to kind of emphasize at the beginning, but a key notion is really variety. Um, so even if you're doing something, again, that's gonna be more of a, as far as high intensity, stagger that. So leave a day in between where maybe, you know, you do a HIIT workout one day and then the next day is gonna be more um, aerobic. So maybe you're going for a walk or a light jog or some strength training. Try to break that up and vary, vary your exercising. But HIIT doesn't, not, it doesn't have to be high impact. So don't confuse high intensity with high impact. I could incorporate exercises that are low impact. So I would avoid things like jumping, plyometrics or things you probably wanna avoid, but I could still be doing something instead of like a jump squat, I could do a stationary squat. So I'm still limiting and, and providing um, full range of motion. I'm maybe incorporating that 30 seconds on, 10 second break, 30 seconds on, 10 second break, but not necessarily high impact activities. So fine tune and, and curtail your activities to more low impact, but you would still get those benefits of an anaerobic exercise, something like a HIIT. All right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, ladies, thank you. And uh, to, to Dr. Kang, who had to jump off for, for class, we thank him as well. Um, I, like I said, I think this was a really diverse and well-rounded panel. So thank you again for all of the information, tips, tricks, suggestions. Um, if we have any other questions that were not answered, I, I think I did uh, miss a couple. I will try my best to uh, direct them to the proper person and hopefully get an answer for everyone uh, to our audience. Thank you for joining us again. And I uh, hope you found this as valuable as I did. Thank you, Pam, for organizing. Thank you all for being part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam, too. Thank, oh, thanks. thank you, Dr. Bruno. That's my furry animal who I can go pet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody take care. Stay healthy. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.